Okay. Okay. So we are at our fire meeting for what is it, April 2024. And uh, this month, our topic is on real estate. So uh, I'm going to turn it over and let you guys just kind of kick it off. Why don't you give us an update on what you know, what's happened so far in, in your world? Ladies first. <laughs> I like how you did that. Um, well, as far as I actually just did a quarterly market update yesterday um, for some of my audience, per se. Um, so everyone who's been waiting for the market to crash still hasn't happened. <laughs> uh, matter of fact, the percentage of appreciation year over year was higher than anticipated. They expected it to be, I think, 2 percentish, and it was closer to 4 or 5. I don't know what the, and I'm curious if you've seen the same data, but that's what I saw yesterday when we looked it up. So. Well, no, and that's nationwide. Were you, oh, nationwide. That's okay. nationwide. Yeah. County to county, in Tarrant County, I think it was, it was about 1% or so, so it was lower here, but it was still high. It was when not I looked. High, I'm sorry, still an increase, not a decrease. When I looked at the latest figures from the Case Shiller Index mm -hmm. uh, for the Dallas Fort Worth metro area, mm -hmm. it was up like 2.8 percent, I believe, year over year, and that was as of January. Because that that yeah. index always runs two months behind. Well, and you would think too. Here's the other interesting thing about the real estate market: is you would think that the numbers are the numbers. Yeah, it depends. On, it <laughs> you depends on what you look that, at. Source. But there yeah. are there are five or six different sources that I think if you so and Case Schiller for some reason tends to be on the lower side typically. They and it's are. because it's to me it's the most robust index because they weed out all of the data that's like um, like flips, for example. They mm -hmm. they weed those out. Okay. Things like uh, homes that might have sold to a relative or things like that. Okay. They have ways of weeding that kind of stuff out. Okay. So they try to get true home sales to give, you know, to give them an idea of what the real market is doing. And so sure. I think that's why you see that number right. different. And that's also why it takes two months for it to come out because they, because of the every month they're massaging that. the data from two months ago and right. so forth. Yeah. Right. Interesting. So, well, if you take the the five or six different sources, I think the the nationwide data is, is higher than the two point eight because they're on the lower yeah. side, and I think there's some some sources that have quoted you know four to five percent or whatever. So it's overall it's higher than what was anticipated nationwide, um, but but still still increasing, and and again anticipating an increase in appreciation this year as well. Yeah. And through, I mean, the next five years for sure. In spite of the fact that interest rates are mm -hmm. high still. And, and possibly instead of rate not, cuts, they might be going up. Exactly. To the 8% mark. Exactly. Okay. When did that happen? That's uh, so. Uh, it came out in March. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, I saw they didn't cut. and But I, I literally just watched an update just within the last week. And I guess maybe my source is late to the to the punch because they're still saying that we'll see cuts throughout the rest nope. of the year. None. Okay. It's going to go up to 8%. Hmm. Fun. Well, I mean, nobody knows, but right. Yeah. That's, well, that but, but that came from Pat. That, so, yeah. So he's, he, there are no uh, plans to cut to rates anytime soon. Yeah. Mm. Awesome. And it's because yeah. of the inflation mm -hmm. ticked up again in yeah. March. That's the reason why. And that just came out like, Yes, yesterday ago. or two days yeah. ago, the inflation figure for March was much right. higher than they thought yeah. it was going to be. Expected 2.1 and it came out at 2.4. We were talking 20 percent difference there. Well, and without sounding like salesy or whatever, this is one of the reasons I keep telling my clients, like, you can't let the market dictate when okay. you make a life change. It's very, like, very similar to the stock market, right? If you can try to time the stock market all you want, it's very similar to timing the real estate market. There's mm -hmm. too much in it. Yeah, there's too much in it. But what I've been telling people when the, well, you know, five minutes ago when I thought the rates were going to go down. Um, <laughs> <laughs> That's why we have but, but but what I've been telling people is when rates do go down, there's all these buyers sitting on the fence. And so we're going to be flooded with that, you know, buyers racing to take advantage of these lower rates. And so 
likely will have a much more competitive market. So right now as a buyer, you have a little bit more leverage, although not always. I just had two multiple offer situations over the weekend. Um, So if the rates go down and people rush to the market, now you're competing harder than you would have had to if you did it now versus now if the rates end up going up, don't you wish you would have bought before they did. So because it's so unpredictable, if it's time to make a life change, it's time to make a life change. And you can't sit and stay waiting for this thing to happen that may or may not ever happen. And again, back to what you said, prices most likely are not going to go down in spite of what rates are doing. Prices are still going up. So, uh, I mean, the interesting corollary to that too is the number of homes being sold is still going down. I looked at that the other day too for DFW and even like for Mansfield year over year, uh, I believe for March, it was down like 20%, like the number of homes that actually the closed. closed yeah. Mm-hmm. Is down 20% year over year. So we're continuing to see like the number of homes selling on the whole going down mm-hmm. while the prices are going up mm-hmm. and interest rates are going up. And I don't know that there's a whole lot that's going to stop that right now Mm -hmm. that trend i mean the at the end of the day though is the real estate market is the real estate market homes are going to continue to appreciate inventory is going to fluctuate things are the interest rates will always be unpredictable um so if you have to relocate if somebody dies and you have an estate that you have to work through and potentially sell a property the real estate market doesn't stop yeah. It just, I mean, there's always a reason for people to move or sell or buy or whatever. So just talked to a client yesterday whose son just got a job offer in Seattle. So is he going to stay here because interest rates are too high to move when he's got this amazing promotion opportunity, you know? So, um, I mean, so it just kind of, we talk about it and we analyze it and obviously we want to be educated, but at the same time, it just, I don't know, we just kind yeah. of have to go with the ebbs and flows and so the one thing that could change the market you know if there is something on the horizon it could be this the elephant in the room <laughs> which is the the before we get to that elephant in the room uh, that's going to be a long topic yeah, right? yeah you know where i'm going with that um i want to address so you just spoke about moving out of seattle my question more so is so we have a, a buffer right now in texas that there are so many out of staters moving into Texas, right? That's that's common knowledge. Right. I want to know. Um, there seem to be real estate agents that are able to get many different out of staters in their door using their brokerage. How is it just having the best SEO? Like I, I can understand building relationships within a community. I don't understand how you have five, seven, eight. Californians reaching out to you from across the nation in order to use your service? Is, is there a... So there, you, there's multiple different, yeah. there's multiple different avenues for that. So for example, I, I was a part of a, it was a coaching organization or whatever, but I went to networking event, and not even networking events, but educational events, seminars and stuff. I would go three or four times a year. So I can legitimately say there's an agent out in Orange County that I know really well, and there's an agent. So I've, I have created relationships throughout the country and, you know, I've got one in Savannah, Georgia. I've got one. It's, so there's, okay, so there's you know, the agents in the, in the uh, other states and then they right. will refer their, And then, so they will refer people to us. So that that's one avenue is that actual personal, personally yeah, relationships. built relationship. Um, another avenue is there are, um, if you're with a national brokerage, yeah. say a Remax or a Coldwell Banker or whatever, they do have um, sort of in their interwebs or whatever their private um, stuff. If I have an if I have a client who's moving to Seattle and I don't know someone in Seattle, I can get in there and say, you know what, I'm going to find another agent with my same brokerage and see if they yeah. would like to take my client. Get a Remax agent might do the listing in Orange County, but then also they're going to need to, they're looking in Dallas. So they will refer to right. a Remax agent. Right. They'll find a Remax side. agent in Dallas. To, right. And okay. since, since there is so much talk recently about the commissions and all of that, I would point blank tell you that 
more often than not, the agent in Seattle who I refer is going to pay me a fee for referring my client to them. So that is one of the reasons that it's advantageous to us to make sure, one, I want my client to have a good experience. That should always be the most important reason. And I don't just refer to anybody. I'm sure you do the same. I will call, yeah. have conversations. I will check their reviews online. I always make sure if I don't know them personally, that they are good at their job and they're good at what they do because I want my client to have a good experience. Mm -hmm. And I want them on this side to know that I'm going to take care of them. And then I know they're getting taken care of on the other side. But there is a there is a monetary compensation for that referral, typically, not always, and yeah. it is negotiable for the record. Sure. They, they yeah. 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 Sorry, I just felt like I needed to state they, that very matter of fact. They have to close in order for that referral fee, right? Correct. Yes. And then there's some like relocation services, right? Yeah. Like if you're within a huge company, they're gonna have a relocation service that works with an agent that's gonna help all of those people, you know, if you're working. I don't know, Google, if you're moving here, they might have a company that they work with and that agent gets all of those people that are coming or they're in a hat and those agents are rotated through. You know, there's different services that yeah. are part of big companies. Yeah. I didn't know something, y'all. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Oh, so you want to talk about the elephant now? Is that what you're talking about? All of them. There's so many. I'm not sure. Which yeah, I don't know where we're going at first. Well, I was going to the lawsuit. Oh, oh that, that one. That one. <laughs> yeah. Is that so, what you were expecting? Yeah. Oh, okay. It's about as large an elephant that we've had in years in the real estate. I think it is. Right? Yeah. It is. I think that's the one thing that could impact the market. That's the to me. That's that is a potential black swan. I, I mean, I don't see it. I'm not saying it's going to be. I'm just saying, depending on how it plays out, and the and the issue I think we all have right now that you agree with me on is we don't know how it's going to play out. We just we're not sure. We know what the lawsuit settlement says. They you don't. Know, you want to go over? It? They don't know what it says. <laughs> the lawsuit. Well, I guess we should briefly summarize it. You know, the lawsuit was. Uh, to go ahead. To that point, I'll just say I. I posted something sort of generic on Facebook. I was surprised at the number of people who reached out to me and said, what are you talking about? It was mm -hmm. kind of a 50-50. As, as I've talked to consumers in the public, it's been about 50-50. About half the people who, and not that I'm bringing it up, but half of the people know what's happening and half of the people don't. If yeah. you're not if you're not a news watcher, like, yeah. um, actually talk a lot like you just asked me about that article, if I had read it or seen it or whatever, I don't typically watch the news as often or frequent or whatever, so I had missed that. This is something you could have easily missed if you weren't a news watcher. So I'm sorry, I mean to interrupt. No, that's, I think you're absolutely right. It seems to me, this is very anecdotal, but it seems to me that the, the longer this progresses, the more people do know about it. I, I mean, back three or four months ago, it seemed to me like if I brought it up to somebody, they they would say, "What are you talking about?" You know, I might say, "Hey, are, are you familiar with this?" And they would say, "I don't even know what you're talking about." Well, this now I've got people enough. now I've got people actually starting to ask Reaching me, out "Hey, now. what do you think about this?" Because and, of the settlement announcement. Announcement. Exactly. So I think between March 15th and March 20th, 22nd, like there was a seven day period where it was all anybody was talking about. Yeah. And now you were talking about the elephant in the room. I was like, "Which one are we talking yeah. about?" Because for at this point, it's been for us, we've been dealing with it for you know, long enough, almost a month now that it kind of is old. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we're still working right. through, yeah. but it's, you know, so, but yes, it definitely needs to be talked about. So I'll stop talking and let you. It uh, still kind of is the elephant. In the room. It is for sure. So sure immediate is. impacts of, 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 has y'all's day-to-day changed at all thus far? Or? Well, let me, let me sum it up for the, yeah. for, the for the radio, audience. for the yeah. radio land people. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> So, in, in essence, I mean, what has happened is there was a lawsuit. Well, there's multiple lawsuits that have been filed, but there's one in particular that was settled. Uh, it was it filed in Missouri against the National Association of Realtors. Um, and the essence of the lawsuit, I'm not going to get this exactly right, legally speaking, but I'll, I'll kind of give you the essence of it. The essence of it was they wanted to... Well, let me let me back up. the The practice for realtors for decades has been when a realtor takes a listing, they talk to the buyer, they get a listing agreement with the buyer, and part of that listing with agreement. The seller. I'm sorry, the seller. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sorry. 
No, no that's <laughs> see, I'm already messing it up. So they get a listing agreement with the seller, and part of the agreement, there is a a amount that the seller is willing to give to the listing agent as commission. And there's also an amount that the seller is willing to give to the buyer's agent as commission, whoever the buyer may be. Of course, at that point, they don't know who that's going to be. Generally, that total commission amount is what's you know listed on the listing agreement between the listing agent and the seller. And then in the MLS, what a listing agent will do is put, okay, I've got this house for sale at 123 Elm Street. And I'm willing to, or the seller is willing to give, say, two and a half percent of the sales price as a commission to the buyer's agent. Mm -hmm. And so that gets advertised publicly, publicly meaning to participants in the MLS. So not publicly to the general public, but it gets advertised to all of the participants in the MLS. And the lawsuit effectively, one of the, there's several things coming out of it, but the big one is it's removing the ability to put that in the MLS, to advertise the buyer's agent commission in the MLS. And so yeah. effectively what they're trying to do is separate, decouple the agent commissions. So I'll, uh, making it more of a negotiable rather than because you brought me a buyer, you automatically get X number of dollars that they there's more of a negotiation opportunity. Also. Well, it's yeah, but they want it to they want the negotiation to happen on on the, the buyer side. Yeah. Like they want the buyers to negotiate directly with their own agents. They don't want the they don't want the buyer's agent to just take whatever whatever's being offered by the seller. They want so, the buyer to negotiate directly with their own agent. And so some of the consequences of this could be well one of the one of the major consequences is it's going to be much more difficult now if this goes through and so let's say this this was a settlement that NAR reached with the attorneys in the lawsuit mm -hmm. the court still has to approve it and it hasn't been approved yet and I don't know when it's going to get approved and I don't know why it takes so long but at any rate it hasn't been approved I'm yet. hearing it could be any day I went to a Texas Association of Realtors meeting last week and TAR is saying that they anticipate it will get approved and they expect it to happen sometime in April. Interesting. So we'll see. We'll so see. we're so, almost uh, halfway there. So mm -hmm. <laughs> so the essentially the, the whole case was based on, it was a class action lawsuit that was filed saying the, the claim was essentially that agents were colluding and coercing, basically violating antitrust to a certain extent to force sellers to pay the compensation of both their listing agent and the buyer's agent. So what Lee just explained, um, what's interesting about his explanation is in, in that is, that is what happens in how a listing, a, we take a listing and then also pay a buyer's agent, but how, who actually pays them is in my opinion, up for interpretation because in my listing agreement and in, te in Texas, actually, in general, in Texas, the listing agreement says, this is my fee. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight percent. I'm not going to give a number because I don't want to get sued. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but whatever my percentage is, this is my percentage. This is what I charge. No matter what, when your house closes, this is the percentage you owe. Out of that percentage, let's just pretend it's five. I am willing to share that commission. If a buyer's agent brings me a buyer, I will pay that agent 2% for bringing me a buyer and helping me sell this. I'm, I'm cooperating with another broker to sell this listing. So in theory, the seller is paying me and I am sharing my commission. But because ultimately it ends up in the other agent's pocket, the claim is that we are coercing and 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 are there agents who to, who walk into listing appointments and say you have to pay this amount or you have to pay the buyer's agent this amount i mean it's always a conversation i think most agents explain to their clients what the benefits are of paying the buyer's agent so here's one thing i will say about sort of the um 
where this will lead or whatever. If you want me to collect my fee and you're not willing to, if you're a seller and you want me to collect my fee and you're not willing to pay a buyer's agent and Mr. Buyer over here really wants to buy your house, but he doesn't have representation because he can't afford it or he's using a VA loan and VA does not allow buyers to pay commission. This has been the case for, for it, it's it's in it's in the regulations. A mm-hmm. VA buyer cannot pay commission. It's a, it's a yeah. closing cost they're not allowed to pay. Mm-hmm. Or first time home buyers who have barely scraped enough pennies together to be able to put their down payment. So they cannot afford to pay a buyer's agent. So Mr. Buyer over here wants to buy your house and you're not willing to pay an agent mm-hmm. or you're not willing to pay me enough to compensate another agent. Am I expected to do my job and their job for that fee? Whatever my fee used to be, am I expected to do two people's jobs for the same fee? Or because the way I kind of see this shaking out, and we're not, but we we can't talk about commissions and percentages, and and that's how we got into this mess in the first place. But what what I would anticipate happening is you're going to have listing agents saying, "This is my fee." If there is a buyer's agent that's getting paid, this is my fee. If I have to work with an unrepresented buyer, this is what I recommend you pay to a buyer's agent because it's in your best interest for all parties to be represented. So I think I think there's going to be sliding scale commissions. I think there's I think I don't I think there's going to be all different ways that agents handle it. But ultimately, the the biggest loser in this whole thing. Is first-time home buyers, VA buyers, um, our lower lower income people who are trying to achieve that American dream. They've been saving for 10 years and they just finally saved up enough money, but now they can't afford representation. There's, I mean, the it's it's the little guy, the lower middle class, or you know, even like that's that's who really loses in this. And that's why I say that that could be the black swan. Yeah. Event for the real estate market. I'm not saying it's going to be, but depending on what does end up shaking out of this, if it if if it does end up squelching, I mean, the first time home buyers are already having trouble right now because of interest rates and, if, and affordability. If, they, yep. if there's there's so many fingers that spread off of this thing, it's it's very complex, and there's lots of discussions about, you know, will will. Will certain loans like uh, well even even VA or FHA mm-hmm. there's discussions about whether now they will allow having uh, the the buyers being able to roll their co- you know commission for their agent into their loan mm-hmm. right now that's illegal across you can, Fannie and Freddie don't allow it certainly VA and FHA don't allow it but there's apparently discussions to get that so I mean that's all these gonna... things could happen but the thing is right now by the time Fannie we don't know. We don't know if any of that's going to happen. And the result of that is if this thing really does go through in July, which we're still not sure. I mean, if it does, if it does happen in April, then, you know, well, part of, part of, let me say this to too. It's still going to affect until July, but it could be approved by April. It could be approved July, by April, yes. but even for it to be effective in July, I don't know. That's not very long. And logistically there has to be, I mean, there have to be software adjustments made right. there, on the technical side to make this actually effective. And I don't know that that's even going to happen in in, not, in uh, 60 days. So it's there's I'm just saying what we don't know is we don't know how this is going to shake out exactly. And if it yeah. ends up being real messy and things, well, it's if it's, <laughs> it's kind of a it's kind of a ready fire aim situation. Yeah. And if it ends up being that so, way, then. You may have more first-time home buyers knocked out of the market, mm-hmm. which could result in a dampening of demand, which could result in, I don't know if the prices are going to go down, but maybe you get a more flattening of home prices. Yeah. So the, the positive piece of the settlement is that there, when the, the settlement finally came to, got introduced or whatever, I think NAR was going to continue to try to fight and all the things. And that was when the DOJ stepped in, I think that they decided they really had to do something. Um, And they couldn't appeal 
um, because of the cost, like NAR would have gone bankrupt. There's a lot of agents really angry right now at NAR because they feel like they sold us out. But the reality is, and, and you can, I will say just on behalf of other agents, I am not as educated as I should be on the other things that they've done and the other things they've lobbied for as far as property owners rights and all of those kinds of things. There are things in the past that you could say maybe NIR has not done right or well or whatever. But in this particular case, that it was their hands were tied. Mm -hmm. They were either going to settle or they were going to go bankrupt. Mm -hmm. Like there was really no other mm -hmm. option. And so what they did by set, if they had gone bankrupt, all of the protections that we as agents have would have sort of disappeared with this. So when that initial suit was filed in Missouri, there's like, I don't know how many other suits now around the country that are considered copycat lawsuits. So part of the settlement is that those copycat lawsuits will settle along with. And so, um, so NAR has put in the settlement that like Lee and I and all of the agents who work for brokerages who did less than, or actually the agents themselves are safe. You can't sue me for the same thing that these people are being sued for. Like we are covered in the settlement. Um, the larger brokerages, the ones that did more than $2 billion in volume, they had to reach their own settlement. They're not covered. And the agents who work for those brokerages are covered, but the actual brokerages yeah. are not. Yeah. Um, so the protection is a, a piece of the settlement that I think a lot of agents are not thinking about and not considering because it does protect us from certain types of lawsuits or whatever to copycat. But then the MLS thing, we cannot put um, compensation into the MLS anymore. We can't advertise it that way. The DOJ could have said, they could have tried to put something down that said, you cannot pay a buyer's agent. Well, they're, so that supposedly is still on the table with the DOJ. And, and the DOJ is, thing is a, a separate issue. I mean, And that's what we're trying to avoid is yeah. the idea of them saying you absolutely cannot because if the if you're not allowed to pay a buyer's agent anymore that changes that's what that's the black swan to me if that like that will change that will change everything because i actually think there will be i think there will be a lot of agents who are able to educate their seller and make them understand why i mean the, the the pendulum has swung so far back in the eighties and nineties before I was selling real estate. Um, I was like in junior high, but <laughs> like it was a long time ago, but there were this same situation happened with, I don't know if it was lawsuits or all like all the things that happened to put us in a place where buyer's agency was created, yeah. where this method of paying buyer's agents came to be because buyers were getting taken advantage of left and right. Mm -hmm. Because listing they agents, didn't have there wasn't buyer agency. There was no buyer's agency. Yeah. So now we've swung the pendulum so far. They're you know they want um, they want compensation to be negotiable. It is by the way. No, I won't say it anyway. Um, <laughs> uh, I think we turned you on. Here. There were so well. There were so many headlines and people like the president of the United States who were incorrect on Joe Biden said in it. Did you see this? He know. said he was so thrilled about the settlement that for the first time, commissions were finally negotiable. No, no, I didn't see. And that. I almost came out of my skin because it was, it's not accurate. And unfortunately when you have the media, headlines like I saw one headline that said real estate cartel finally broken up yeah. and I saw I mean, I mean I have seen some of the nastiest headlines and I'm like we are not all selling sunset we're not showing million dollar houses every day we're not we're we're walking away from the dinner table with our families and meeting up with people after work hours because that's when they can look at property and we are driving all over the metroplex trying to find them what they want we are answering text messages and phone calls at nine and ten o'clock because you have a first-time home buyer who is terrified or paranoid or something came up in their inspection and they don't know most of us are really good at what we do and most of us are not selling sunset mm -hmm. and so what hgtv and netflix and all these you know shows have done to our industry have made it look like we're just making money hand over fist when the reality is we're just trying to take care of people 
And apparently we're not, we're just door openers who are not worth the pennies that we get paid. So sorry. <laughs> I Don't get me on a soapbox, Hamilton. <laughs> Um, so I, so Lee, you had mentioned the possibility of rolling if the buyer rolling the commission into the loan amount, and I'll throw out a figure that I've heard for most of my life as as three percent, right? Mm -hmm. um, I also have heard about you. You can typically um, you can do a standard mortgage loan with as low as three and a half percent down. Mm -hmm. So if we're, if we're doing three and a half percent down, but then we're rolling uh, three and a half percent of the appraised value, but then we're rolling 3% into the mortgage, we have, uh, essentially have a fully funded loan, almost a hundred percent loan value in this loan amount. Mm -hmm. That makes the real estate debt market more risky immediately. Um, sure. What happens when the real estate debt market is more risky, they're going to compensate it with rates. And that could also then. Ooh, that's an interesting, yeah, um, that's a very rates. interesting uh, thought experiment there. <laughs> yeah. But you're absolutely right. I mean, that could be one of the consequences of this. All it would take is a first nine month default and have just a 5% market drop. And, and 5%, I, and that, that might be starting. Uh, 3% market drop in your, your essentially, you have a default at the mortgage balance. Yeah. Um, I mean, what it does is if, if this becomes the case and there's, you know, I'm, I'm pausing for a second because I want to, I don't want to chase rabbits here, but one of the things that this could do is it, it could make a situation where the home buyer is underwater. Like if you're doing what you're talking about, if you're hundred percent financed mm -hmm. and essentially you're more than, you're more than hundred percent financed, maybe, right. Depending on what the commission is and all that, you could end up being 110% financed. Mm -hmm. So you're underwater immediately mm -hmm. as soon as you get into the house. And so it, it could make a situation where it, if in a, in a market where home prices are not going up, then it can make a really tough situation on the finance industry because now there is a much higher risk of mm -hmm. default yeah. and just walking go, away from the loan. You go back to, I, I don't think we're anywhere near this, obviously, but the, the crash of 08 or whatever, a lot of that happened because of people being financed to the hill. Some of it was they shouldn't have qualified anyway. And, you know, affordable income and all that. There's a million different reasons that cause that. But the reason people couldn't get out of their houses when they got in trouble, the reason they got foreclosed on and didn't sell is because they didn't have any equity. Um, and, and that's the because they were, were doing, was, they were doing 80, 20 loans. And that's why they didn't have any equity because they couldn't afford, maybe they could afford to pay their loan off if they got every dollar, but you have to pay fees when you sell a house, you have to pay a realtor, you have to pay, you know, so cheaper for the bank to foreclose. Yes. So yeah. they couldn't, so they couldn't get out because they, they had either no equity, negative equity, or just too little equity to get out and still pay the fees and whatnot. So that's, and you saw a lot of short sales. Um, people trying to get out that way. Um, so it just will make it and it'll make it harder or impossible for people who are in that equity position to sell. So I do see one another option for people if they can't finance their closing costs and the seller says they're not willing to compensate a buyer's agent or whatever, you can still ask for concessions in your contract. You know, if you have the money for your down payment and your closing costs and you don't need the concessions in the contract to, to pay for your closing costs, then you can ask, well, I'd like $10,000 in seller's concessions. And the seller can't dictate to you how you use those. So if that's a piece of the negotiation and you decide, I'm going to credit that those pay, seller pay concessions or a portion of them to the agent. Right. But but it also is another reason and, and um, that agents are going to have to be educated and be willing to talk about compensation and be willing to explain to their clients. If someone's going to be in a potentially negative equity situation, they need to understand that. They need to know the implications of that. They need to understand, you know, 
And sellers who are not willing to offer compensation need to understand that if a buyer believes they should have representation and they don't want to buy a house without it, and there's three houses on the block that look very similar, and you're the only one not offering compensation, they're probably not going to buy your house. So we're not always going to be in a low inventory market. There were, you know what I mean? So there, there will come a time, I think, when when sellers, I don't want to say they'll be forced to because that's how we got sued, but they that'll be a piece of what they need to do in order to to find a buyer for their home. Because buyers don't like, there's this, I think it's 87% of buyers surveyed say, say, I absolutely want a representative and someone to help me. You know, there's not as many, you know, those, I can take care of it myself kind of people out there as you think. Yeah, you it's know? a big decision for people. Most people and want help. Most people, it's, they only do it once or twice in their life. So, mm -hmm. and it's a complete, or it can be a complicated process. So having somebody to kind of guide you through it yeah. is crucial in, all, in most cases. Well, I think because of, from a customer service perspective, I think I've, I've always joked with my clients, like my job is to catch all the stress and, and stuff before it gets to you, right? Like this should be as stress-free for you as possible. From a customer service perspective, I want my people to have a good experience, but we've almost customer service ourselves out of a job because they don't understand how hard we work and everything that we're doing on the back end because we want everything to be happy for them. <laughs> Would you agree with that? I don't know. I think I, I think people that we work with know. Agree. I mean, the people that we have, yes. people that I have worked with, they know what I've done on the back end. Most Because I usually tell them, look, right. this happened and this happened because I don't want them to come up later. If right. something goes crazy and you know, I want them know right. that I did this or had this conversation. Right. So I think people that work with us know. I think it I think people who don't or haven't dealt in real estate in a while, maybe they bought a home 15 years ago and it's mm -hmm. kind of out of sight, out of mind. The process is out of sight, out of mind. Right. I think those folks are the ones going, yeah, what do these guys really do? You know? Right. Or they're watching Netflix and they're just seeing well, the million dollar homes. Yeah. I mean that's right. probably my right. generation yeah. of like, oh, they make it look so easy. And yeah, right. they're partying well, and having a that's great why, time. That's why there are, I just saw a picture that Arbor posted, um, the Arlington Board of Realtors, of the number of people at the new, so every month Arbor has new member orientation, new this. agent orientation. And there was probably 60 people in that room. Mm -hmm. And it's only once, a, it's once a month. I'm like, all of these people are coming into this business and it it is crazy to me, especially with, even with the media and the way they're making the market sound. And, you know, I, you know, I have people ask me all the time, like, is the market as bad as it sounds? Or, and I'm like, you know, anyway, good, bad, ugly. It, it's all perception, like depending on who you are and what you do, but the, um, the number of agents coming into real estate, I don't, the failure rate is like 87%, 87% of people that get their real estate license, 18 months from the day they get their license will no longer be in the business. But it's been that way for years. It has That's been that like way for years. Number. That's not a new number, but it's been that way for years. But to your point, selling sunset makes it look so easy. Yeah. And HGTV makes it look so easy. Well, pass is 100 days. Yeah, there's yeah. a problem with that. Yeah. 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 Totally fine. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. So, and don't commit. They are entertaining to a certain Absolutely, extent, yeah. yeah. Um, but that's I think why they sell. That's yeah. <laughs> that's why they're on. That's why they're on. Um, but yeah, I don't. So at the end of the day, I mean, just to kind of wrap this up, you know, the the real estate market is changing. I mean, yes. the, in terms of how real estate transactions are done, that's changing, mm -hmm. and we don't know exactly how it's going to shake down. We don't know exactly what it's going to look like six months from now. There's a lot of conjecture and you can go read a bajillion articles out there right now, op-eds, opinion pieces. I mean, everybody's got, an, this is like anything else that happens. That's right. big news. Everybody's got an opinion and you get people that dig their heels in. Oh, this is so bad. Oh, this is so good. And you have this, you know, clashing of, right. of ideals and you know what? It's going to, it's going to shake down, mm -hmm. Who knows but it's going to shake down at some point. Things will level out and everybody's going to be fine. At some point, so we just at the you know in the meantime, I think we all just you have to stay vigilant. And if if you're in the market to either buy a house or sell a house, the big thing is to be aware that this is going on and the process that you're going to go through. If you're already 
if you have a house listed right now, then you know you're still under the old system, so to speak, and that's mm -hmm. going to be the way it's going to work. If you're thinking about buying a house and you may start looking, say, two or three months from now, things might look different for you as a buyer. And I think you just have to be aware of that. So a couple of the takeaways I want people to get from this is, number one, all the headlines, all the commissions. have, and, and I prefer to use the word compensation versus commission. I think that's one of the reasons that people get so angry about it. It's like anyway, but. It's weird that vocabulary can make that big of a difference, but compensation commission has always been negotiable. It has always been negotiable um, and sellers have never been forced to pay a certain amount. I have in my career had plenty of situations where the buyer's agent was not being offered whatever the public thinks the traditional compensation would be. Um, so this is not new. It's not, it, it's always been this way. Now we just can't advertise inside of MLS to other agents what a seller would be willing to pay. So mm -hmm. um, also one other change to that settlement is before an agent can show a buyer a home, they have to have some sort of written agreement. With the buyer. Before, before I before I can lock you into a house, the uh, settlement says that I have to have an agreement with you. I think we're going to see some new forms created. I think we're going to see yeah. one time one time showing type of agreements, and I think we're going to see some new forms created by our our Texas uh, Real Estate Commission, but um, or Texas Association of Realtors. We will. I I do think we'll see that, but. Yeah. There has to be some sort of representation agreement. Like if I show you this house and you decide to buy it, um, then, oh, and one other change. Sorry, I know we need to wrap up. If you agree to say, let's just, we'll use your number of 3%. If I have an, a written agreement with a buyer that says um, that I'm charging a 3% commission to be your buyer's agent. If you walk into a builder or someone who's offering a bonus or some other, and this is part of the commissions should be more negotiable piece of it, like not just a flat rate offered to every buyer's agent. I cannot accept any more in compensation than what's in my contract with you, with you as the buyer. So if my fee is 3%, but there's, builders around town that are offering, wow. you know, 5% if you sell in this community or because, and that's the thing that builders do a lot. If contracts executed by X date, will pay you a 4% or 5% or whatever, they'll pay a larger commission because there's inventory homes that they're trying to move faster. So they're trying to get agents to bring their people out there. Um, so the buyer's agreement says this is my fee and now the settlement says you cannot accept any more than that if someone offers you more you have to credit the rest of it back to the buyer or, or not accept it or something i don't know how that all plays out but you can so that's a change that's really going to affect the realtor more than the buyer i mean it could affect the buyer a little bit but mm -hmm. it's that's that's more of a change there's several changes like i said this thing has so many fingers to it that well it'll affect the realtor more than the buyer but there are situations where sellers would offer, I mean, I, sellers would offer bonuses or right. but like, if so you sell by a certain day. Yes. Or, yeah. So it, it I feel does like it would impact the buyer. If the buyer is going to get a 2% credit that's coming out of the pocket of the builder and their agent is still getting the compensation that they're owed um, at the same rate, that is, um, and there's no, no negative incentive for the agent to bring them to that builder as long as we're talking, as, no, as long as the house that they would. It's it, not a negative incentive. Mm -hmm. And you're right. It could impact the buyer if that ends up being what happens. If it the could. if the builder ends up paying the buyer the extra 2%. Mm -hmm. But I think that, build, but, but I, we don't know that that's what's going to happen. But, I think builders will stop offering bonuses to agents and they'll start yeah. increasing the incentives they're offering to buyers. Because, yeah. you know, I, I mean, as much as um, this lawsuit frustrates us because we're not the people that are colluding and whatever there are agents out there that they see, they see a builder offering a $10,000 bonus and they show every client they have that community because they are trying to get that. Like there are, there are agents oh, it's out there. Oh, to the agent, not yes. the, oh, okay. So I thought it was almost um, towards closing costs or something for the buyer. No, there's bonuses for the agent Today. and there's, and yes, there's bonuses Today. for the agent and there's incentives for the buyer. Okay. So there are agents out there who will show 
certain communities because okay. the bonuses are good or they work with a certain builder because if you close X number of transactions, um, you know, so yeah. anyway. All right, well, there's your, there's your real estate Sorry. rap. Thank, thank you all very much for, for the summary. Any more too. elephants. I think but there's, there's, <laughs> there's the elephant. And you, what did I say about an elephant? How do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. time. There we go. All right. Great way to end it. <laughs> Thank you guys. Appreciate it.